Hi friends, Father Frank Pavone here, director of Priests for Life. We're going to do an interview here uh, by Leslie, our communications director, about my new book, Proclaiming the Message of Life. So we invite you to stay with us as we examine what's in this book and how you can use it both for yourself and for your pastors. We'll be starting in just a moment. We're also periscoping this event, and we're also videotaping it for our YouTube and website. All right. Father, I just have some questions for you about the book, which uh, for our viewers, it was published by Servant Books just this past April. How did you get the idea to write a book like Proclaiming the Message of Life, and how long did it take you to get it all together? Well, you know, this is my fourth book, and I'm the most excited about it because it is the fruit of some 25 years of work. Uh, when I first became a, a deacon, actually, and started preaching in the pulpit, I was preaching constantly about abortion, then during my parish years, and then, of course, once I started full-time work with Priests for Life in 1993, I had the privilege of preaching on abortion every day in churches all around the country and all around the world, and up to this day have done the same. Therefore, being able to focus in on this one issue and carefully see uh, the responses of other clergy and also of the people in the congregation to the message of pro-life and being able to refine that message over the years. Now, very few priests are in a position where they preach on the same topic all the time. You have to have a very specialized ministry, as, of course, the priests who work at Priests for Life and I do. So in the course of doing that, we've been able to preach on abortion on every single Sunday of the year and in the major holidays and feast days as well. And so we've learned how to take the readings of those Sundays and draw out the pro-life significance and implications of those readings. This book is the fruit, therefore, of two and a half decades of study, preaching, and proclaiming uh, the word of life and then hearing the responses of the people and refining the message accordingly so that it can have the most impact. It's also the result of working with clergy to find out what do they need to know to encourage them to also proclaim this message. So I assume pe priests and pastors are your main target audience, but who else are you hoping to reach with the book? First of all, as you say, priests and pastors, deacons, uh, and we're not just talking about it in the Catholic ch Church, but in all different denominations will benefit from this. Our brothers and sisters in other Christian denominations often have the same readings on Sunday as we do because they use what's called the common lectionary. Uh, but even if they don't, the book is extremely helpful because it covers so many different aspects of Scripture. Uh, for any preacher whatsoever to know how to convey a message of pro-life. But it's not just for the clergy, as you, as you suggest. Uh, it is also for the laity because the person in the pew who's hearing the message of life will also want to prepare sometimes for the Sunday Mass uh, by, by looking at the readings in advance. And especially if someone has a particular interest in pro-life, They'll want to use this book to, to take that week's readings and let those readings nourish specifically their commitment to defend the unborn. You said that there are three main components to the book. Can you tell us about each of them? Yes. One of them we've been touching on already, which is every Sunday of the year, a reflection on the readings. It's not actually a homily on the readings. It's several paragraphs that explain how one would develop a homily drawing on the theme of those readings. So it's for the Sundays of the whole year and then for all three years of the liturgical cycle because the Sundays come in year A, year B, and year C. So we've covered them all. That's the main bulk of this book. Another key section is I deal with several dozen common fears and objections that clergy have, hesitations, obstacles, if you will, in their own minds and hearts to preaching about abortion. And so the book, again, based on our interaction with the clergy over, over 25 years, uh, will help them to overcome those obstacles and hesitations. That's helpful, of course, for the priest or pastor directly to read. It's also helpful for others to read because then it will assist them to encourage their priest or deacon or pastor to preach this message of life. So that's one another section with all those common objections. And then finally, uh, actually in the beginning of the book, a broad overview of how and why do we preach on abortion. So it gives the, the what, sh what should be the main contents of a pro-life homily, and it also takes into account 
what do the American people think about abortion? What is the common attitude about it? Because anyone speaking in any context, whether it's a homily or any kind of public talk, knows that one of the most important things is to know your audience. So for example, when you're talking about an audience of church-going Christians, well, most of them are going to be pro-life. Not all, but most of them are going to be. So what is the thing that the preacher needs to keep in mind? What he has to keep in mind is, the goal is not so much to convince those people that abortion is wrong, as to convince them that it is any of their business. Because the prevailing attitude is, oh, well, of course it's wrong, I would never do it. But if somebody else does it, what business is that of mine? Who am I to interfere? And what we have to do is help people realize, yes, of course it's your business. Because the Gospels call us to love one another. The Gospels call us to care for one another. The Gospels call us to intervene for the helpless and to rescue those who are being dragged to death. So of course it's our business if someone else is having an abortion. So this line of thought is one example of how we take the prevailing attitudes of people on abortion and guide the preacher as to what it is that he or she is supposed to be accomplishing uh, at that moment with that congregation. When did you first start looking at scripture and trying to draw out its pro-life message? Was it in seminary? When I was in high school is when I first began, uh, began looking at this because uh, that's when I awakened both to, the, to the, uh, the scriptures, the love of scripture, started reading scripture every day, uh, and to the love of the pro-life movement. I was a senior in high school. This was 1976. And this is when I really began to uh, immerse myself both in the scriptures and in the pro-life cause. So I've been thinking about it and talking about it and writing about it ever since. So can we assume that you can look at any scripture verse and draw something pro-life from it? You can look at any page of scripture and draw something pro-life. Even those long lists of, of difficult names in the Old Testament. It's the, every, the scripture is, is called the word of life. God himself is life. And so when God speaks, it's always about life, always. About lifting up life, preserving and defending life, celebrating life, lifting life up to the very throne of God. And that's what salvation is all about. It's God creating and redeeming human life so that human beings can live with him for all eternity. He's a God of life, and therefore he's in the business of destroying death. And scripture is that great history by which God destroys death. How is this book particularly help, helpful in, the, uh, in this year of mercy? In the year of mercy, uh, the church is inviting us to understand that mercy has two components. It's not only the forgiveness of sins, that's what we usually think about, but it's also the intervention to save the helpless. God's first act of mercy towards us was not the first time he forgave a sin of ours. It was when he created us. We were totally helpless. We, were, we weren't even there. We couldn't ask to be created. He created us purely of his own initiative and out of his own love. That's mercy. And mercy now, if we live mercy, as this year of mercy calls us to do, we are to intervene to save the helpless. And so any work that's done in the pro-life movement to rescue the unborn from abortion is by its very definition, mercy. But then of course, the other meaning of it, to forgive the sins that we have committed and that we have then repented of, is a very large part of the work of Priests for Life and of uh, the message of this book. That anyone who has been guilty of the sin of abortion in any way and no matter how many times, can still turn back to the Lord of life. You know, we, we operate Rachel's Vineyard, as you know, the Silent No More Awareness campaign. These are urgent cries for reconciliation and healing. We're saying to all those who feel alienated from God and the church because of abortion that they can come back. And now's the time to come back. We have ministered to people who have had as many as 25 abortions. And to them we say the doors of the church are open. Come back now and find that healing. So as in this book, Proclaiming the Message of Life, we help the preacher to preach on abortion and the person in the congregation to understand how the faith leads to, to that message, they will see throughout the pages of this book this theme of mercy and healing because it's so much a part of the church's message, so much a part of the pro-life movement.